and the Research Administration Office is the sponsor of the bioethics program at Iowa State. I want to say just a little bit about the bioethics program so you can see how this activity tonight fits into it. Uh, in the late 1980s, the Iowa legislature provided a, uh, additional funding, in fact, quite a substantial amount of extra funding for Iowa State University to work in the area of uh, biotechnology. And a part of that was uh, to finance a building, the micro a molecular biology building on campus. And there were lots and lots of dollars put into the program here, uh, much of it originally coming out of the lottery fund. And uh, as they did that, as they moved into this biotechnology realm, the legislature, at least a sufficient number of them, felt it was important to discuss or have co uh, a concern for the ethics of what was being done in biotechnology. And so the university agreed to set aside a certain amount of the money for biotechnology into a bioethics program. In the first years of the bioethics program here, the focus was on essentially assembling data and information from all kinds of sources all across the country and around the world. And then in the fall of 1989, the vice provost for research, Patricia Swan, decided to turn the focus inward for a while to see what we could do on the campus itself. Professor Gary Comstock of the philosophy department at Iowa State was put in charge of the program and he really is the one who has uh, managed this program for the last four years. The on-campus program then has taken the form of a fall colloquium, so this will be the fourth annual colloquium on bioethics, and a uh, early summer or late spring, depending on how you look at it, uh, institute in which approximately 25 faculty members from the biological sciences and other related areas uh, get together for a full week and discuss ethical issues. In both the colloquium and in the Summer Institute, a major aspect of the process is to have debates about ethical issues, where we take experts who take polar positions on a particular issue to illustrate the great breadth of ethical issues that do arise when we talk about biological topics in general, biotechnology in specific terms. So tonight we will have our fourth fall colloquium in a debate format, and we hope it will be a friendly debate. Uh, these people uh, will uh, take positions uh, rather at, odd, at odds with each other and, and uh, go at it. So that's the purpose. The on-campus program we feel has been very successful. This year, instead of having a fourth summer institute, we are spending our time and energy evaluating the institutes of the previous three years, and then we hope to uh, work off that next year in perhaps a new direction or perhaps strengthening and continuing in the areas that we feel have been very successful. So I'm happy to be hosting the fourth annual colloquium on bioethics. And I now want to turn the uh, podium over to Professor Richard Van Eyten of the Philosophy Department, who will introduce the topic and the debate. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. I'm Dick Van Eyten, and I'm pleased to see you all here tonight. Uh, Gary Comstock gives me a nice opportunity every now and then to be associated with this program, and I really enjoy that. I should say at the outset that uh, Gary Comstock came into this program in a context which involved uh, changing of leadership, people leaving the university, and a uh, circumstance of uh, drift could have occurred, but Gary came in and took over the program, and the result has been a very gratifying outcome to this point in time, and we're confident beyond. This evening's meeting, if it were looked at from the standpoint of undergraduate pedagogy, uh, has to do with the idea that uh, contrary to popular opinion and general views about these matters, there is a connection between the way people act and the way people think. Uh, that essentially is what philosophy is all about from my perspective. And you'll see as you listen to the participants in this debate that what 
underlies the perspectives they take is not some esoteric theoretical dispute, but essentially and ultimately a debate that has to do with uh, what difference does the discussion concerning the possible instrumental value of prairies have to do with the way in which we might conduct ourselves as enlightened and decent-minded citizens. I'm pleased to introduce, in the reverse order in which they will appear, first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lily Marlene Rousseau, Rousseau, who is an associate professor of philosophy at Purdue University. Uh, Lily Marlene Rousseau received her PhD from Princeton, and her main research interests are in the areas of ethics and animals, philosophy of mind, and environmental ethics. She's done a lot of writing and is well known. And her colleague, Baird Kalikok, is equally accomplished. He's a professor of philosophy and the coordinator of letters and science, uh, the letters and sciences program at the, in the environmental studies program at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. And he's on the editorial board of a publication that's well known in the country, the Environmental Ethics publication. He's uh, one of the people who, perhaps the best the person who knows best, uh, Aldo Leopold, done a great deal of research with regard to Leopold, and he's the author of a well-known book in defense of the uh, land ethic. Each will take a different view with regard to the question, does the Iowa prairie have an intrinsic value? And I should point out to you that you could put in the area of prairie virtually anything you wanted to do that has to do with the environment around us. It could be animals, it could be mountains, it could be rivers, it could be prairies. Last, before we start, the program is designed to go about an hour and a half. Each speaker will take approximately 25 minutes. At the end of the two 25-minute presentations, there will be a repartee between the speakers, and then following that, they're eager to get into discussion with you, and they're I know from being with them, their preference is to have discussion, and in that respect, uh, the debate atmosphere is something they will move away from, I'm guessing, because they're interested in learning, just as you are too. Um, we'll stop about 9.30. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Baird Kalachak. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, I'd like to uh, tell all of you how um, much how much honored I am to be invited uh, here to Iowa State University. This is my second uh, formal visit uh, to Iowa State. I was here in 1987 uh, at a an event that was uh, lasted several days. It was in this building in a number of the rooms, uh, centennial celebrating the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of Aldo Leopold's birth. Aldo Leopold, as I'm sure all of you know, being here for an environmental ethics um, event, uh, was um, uh, uh, the author of a Sam County Almanac, which is sometimes referred to as the Bible of the contemporary uh, conservation movement. And uh, Leopold is a native um, son of um, Iowa. He was born and, and raised in Burlington, and so that's why this event uh, was, was held here. It was organized by Tom Tanner, um, and um, so I, I, I feel uh, sort of at home um, coming back. Um, I'm uh, glad to see so many of you have come out this evening on a Saturday uh, night. Uh, for an ethics event. That's the night we usually re reserve to try to be as unethical uh, <laughs> as, as we can, uh, but uh, with, within limits. Uh, but um, uh, I, I'm sure that we're going to have a lively debate. I've been asked to address the question, uh, does the Iowa prairie have intrinsic value? Uh, since the time of the ancient Greeks, Philosophers usually try to address specific questions by a circuitous route. First, we transform the specific question into a more general one. Then, only after we address the general question, do we return to the original question, which we treat as a special case. 
to take an example that every sophomore is familiar with, uh, suppose someone asks a philosopher, is Socrates, and since the original Socrates is, of course, uh, demonstrably mortal, um, uh, I'll make this a, a, a Socrates whom we, who's not yet dead, and so we don't really know, uh, for sure in this case, is Socrates Thermopolis, who uh, let us hypothesize as a contemporary Greek-American who, who owns a restaurant in, in Ames, mortal. Um, uh, the philosopher asks first, are all men mortal? And addressing that question with inductive logic, so far they all are, um, therefore all the rest must be as well, uh, she draws the universal conclusion that indeed all men are mortal. Then, observing that Socrates is a man, uh, our philosopher returns to the original question and confidently concludes that yes, Socrates is mortal. An example I'm sure you're all familiar with. So, does the Iowa Prairie have intrinsic value? Proceeding according to the pattern first illust just illustrated, let's ask more generally, do prairies have intrinsic value, whether they are in Illinois, uh, Iowa, Wisconsin, Kansas, uh, Nebraska, or wherever? But even that question is not general enough for for philosophers to want to try to address. Prairies are excellent examples. Indeed, the first generation of ecologists uh, regarded them as paradigm cases of biotic communities. Moving up another rung on the generalization ladder, we might ask, do biotic communities have intrinsic value? But biotic communities, or ecosystems as they were later called, are themselves only one sort of distinctly holistic biological entity. Species are another. Thus, the actual question that has recently been debated, mooted in environmental philosophy, is not do prairies have intrinsic value, uh, or even do biotic communities have intrinsic value, but do some biological wholes as well as some biological individuals have intrinsic value. Now the next thing that philosophers are want to do after generalizing a question posed to them is to define the terms in which they are formulated. In the textbook example, men does not refer to male as opposed to female human beings, it refers in a notoriously gender-biased way, uh, to human beings irrespective of gender. And leaving open another question, the question of life after death, mortal refers to somatic, not psychic, death. Similarly, in respect to the present question, I need to indicate what the term biological holes refers to and what intrinsic value means. Species are fairly clear and straightforward cases of biological wholes, just as specimens are fairly clear and straightforward cases of biological individuals. The sperm whale is a, is a biological whole. Moby Dick is a biological individual. Just what a species may be, more precisely, uh, is not uncontroversial. Are species abstract classes? This was the, the traditional view. Uh, the more recent population biologists tend to regard them as sets of populations, uh, more reductively still as gene pools, or some far out biologists regard them as supra individual sort of protracted in space and time. However species, however, species may be technically defined in theoretical biology and the philosophy of biology, we have a clear enough idea of what a species is to regard the current episode of abrupt mass anthropogenic species extinction as a cause for alarm. Just what a biotic community may be, more precisely, is if anything a matter of more controversy in theoretical uh, biology and the philosophy of biology than what a species uh, may be. But again, we have a clear enough idea 
of what a biotic community is to recognize the difference between a prairie and a cornfield and to regard the wholesale replacement of the former by the latter as a cause for alarm. What about intrinsic value? Intrinsic value may be defined in contradistinction to instrumental value. The instrumental value of a thing is its usefulness to something or to someone else. Tools are paradigm cases of things the value of which is exclusively instrumental. When a tool wears out, it becomes totally valueless, except perhaps as material to be recycled. Each one of us human beings believes that his or her own total value exceeds his or her instrumental value, uh, that is, his or her usefulness to family members, to friends, to employers, and to society. Each of us believes, in other words, that he or she has intrinsic value in addition to his or her instrumental value. Thus, the first approximation of what intrinsic value means is this. Intrinsic value is the value left over after we subtract someone's or something's instrumental value. What gives some things but not others value over and above their instrumental value? Various answers to this question have been proposed in the past. If some things have been created in the image of God and others have not, then a good case might be made that those created in the image of God have intrinsic value and those not so created don't have it. But the image of God is a property, the possession of which cannot be ascertained by empirical means. Historically, Western philosophers have sought a more secure and universally persuasive justification um, uh, for their own claims and those of their fellow man, as they once referred uh, to the rest of us, to possess intrinsic value. But at the same time, they wished self-servingly to rule out claims made on behalf of non-human beings. Preferring to follow, then, not Moses, but Aristotle, who characterized man, that is, the species more formally named Homo sapiens, as the rational animal, many Western philosophers, Immanuel Kant is noteworthy, is a noteworthy example, attributed intrinsic value to all rational beings. Thus, God, if God exists, the heavenly host of angels, if they exist, the immortal souls of somatically dead human beings, if they exist, and somatically living human beings all have intrinsic value because all are putatively rational. Everything else has, conveniently for us human beings, at best only instrumental value. Unfortunately, not quite all human beings are in fact rational. Human infants severely retarded, profoundly demented, and abjectly senile people are not. Therefore, if rationality is the intrinsic value conferring property, we should be able, within the bounds of morality, to treat these so-called marginal cases of humanity as we do all the other beings who are instrumentally but not also intrinsically valuable. We should be able to perform, that is, painful medical experiments on babies, hunt the retarded and demented, and make dog food out of the senile. But even to suggest such things is outrageous and obnoxious, and I would not have dared to do so except dramatically to make the point that rationality is too narrow a basis for intrinsic value. In order to include all human beings, the marginal cases, in the class of beings that have intrinsic value, recently some philosophers, Peter Singer most notably, have suggested that the capacity to suffer is a more inclusive 
intrinsic value conferring property. More inclusive indeed, not um, uh, because if all sentient beings have intrinsic value, then not only will the human marginal cases have it, so will a very wide range of animals. And that, of course, is exactly what Peter Singer, the animal liberationist, had in mind all along. Singer's powerful ploy set others philosopher, other philosophers with even wider concerns to thinking. Why draw the intrinsic value line between beings that are sentient and those that are not? Non-sentient animals and plants, after all, have interests, have goods of their own, which they try to fulfill. It makes sense, in other words, to say that uh, that paving a parking lot around a tree is not in the tree's interest, it's not good for it, and their interests can be frustrated whether they consciously suffer therefrom or not. They too, plants as well as animals, are striving, potentially thriving beings, no less than are we. Shouldn't we therefore admit that they too have intrinsic value, no less than do we? Environmental philosopher Paul W. Taylor, on the basis of such reasoning as this, concluded that all living things, all living beings, have intrinsic worth, which is only another, uh, in what he called inherent worth, which is only another name for intrinsic value. But also on the basis of just such reasoning, Taylor explicitly and strictly limited inherent worth to individual living beings. On this account, biological wholes, such as species and biotic communities, lack intrinsic value. Other philosophers have tried to extend Taylor's account of intrinsic value to species and to ecosystems on the decidedly shaky supposition that species are spatially and temporally protracted supra-individuals and that ecosystems have interests in the same way that organisms do. But the weight of opinion in evolutionary biology and theoretical ecology does not support such eccentric characterizations of species and ecosystems. So, returning to the, our original question, does the Iowa prairie have intrinsic value, this line of argument leaves us not only with a negative conclusion, but with an implausible, an implausible alternative conclusion. In general, all individual living things have intrinsic value, but no biological holes have it. Therefore, the prairie community has no intrinsic value, neither has its several species, such as big blue stem, Indian grass, compass plant, round-headed bush clover, lupin, and butterfly weed, to mention but a few, but its individual components have it. This stalk of blue stem, this stalk of Indian grass, this compass plant, this bush of round-headed clover, this sprig, of lupin, and this particular butterfly weed. That doesn't sound right, does it? Therefore, we had better back up and take another tack. First, let's diagnose the problem with the foregoing tack and ask how it leads to the implausible conclusion that all biological specimens, individuals, but no species or biotic communities, holes, have intrinsic value. Each step seems sound enough. The image of God is not an empirical criterion. Rationality is too exclusive. Non-sentient living things also have interests and goods of their own. Perhaps we are looking for intrinsic value in the wrong place, in the valuees, instead of in the valuers. Now, a cornerstone of modern science and philosophy is the proposition that objective nature is value neutral, value free. If we imagine that all subjectivity, all consciousness were obliterated at a single stroke, then all value would disappear with it and only impassive phenomena would remain. 
Value is a verb, first and foremost, and a noun only derivatively. Nothing actually has value, either instrumental or intrinsic. Rather, things are valued, either instrumentally or intrinsically. Under this interpretation, the difference between instrumental value and intrinsic value is this. Someone or something is instrumentally valuable when he, she, or it is valued because he, she, or it is useful to someone else. Someone or something is intrinsically valuable when he, she, or it is valued for his, her, or its own sake. Now, each of us human beings values himself or herself intrinsically. That is, whatever it may mean to say that each of us values himself or herself instrumentally to the extent that we are useful to ourselves, whatever that means, it is crystal clear what it means to say that we value ourselves intrinsically, that is to say, for our own sakes. More problematic is whether we value anyone or anything else intrinsically. I think we do. Who is prepared to be so cynical as to say that the only way that one human being values others is merely instrumentally? That is, values others only to the extent that they are useful to him or herself. The most unambiguous case is the way most parents value their child for its own sake. Further, we believe that the hallmark of true friendship is that friends value one another intrinsically. If one quote-unquote friend values another only instrumentally, he or she is no true friend. Is anyone prepared to say then that true friendship is totally non-existent? But if we can value our children and friends intrinsically, then we can in principle value anything under the sun intrinsically. Genuine humanitarians value all human beings intrinsically. Some fervent anti-abortionists seem genuinely to value each and every human embryo and fetus intrinsically, though some anti-abortionists, anti not all, judging by their views on welfare, high taxes for quality education, and capital punishment, seem to cease to value each and every child after it's born. But uh, that's, that's enough just to, just to see if we're awake here. Okay? <laughs> Animal rights advocates animal rights advocates value animals intrinsically, and some environmentalists value biological wholes, species and ecosystems intrinsically. We can value anything or even everything intrinsically, but as a matter of fact, we don't actually value just anything or everything intrinsically. What is the general principle of, its, of discrimination? Why do we value a child, a friend, a nameless starving Somali, though I think we're sort of running out of intrinsic value for them, as, as according to the newspapers, a pet intrinsically, but not, but not a lamp or a brick? What sorts of things stimulate the intrinsic value center in our central nervous systems? In the second magnum opus, the Descent of Man, Charles Darwin suggested that what stimulates what he called more quaintly our altruistic moral sentiments was the recognition of fellowship and community. The moral sentiments evolved, he argued, in conjunction with human social evolution. No tribe, Darwin points out, could hold together if murder, robbery, treachery, and so forth were common. Consequently, such crimes within the limits of the same tribe are, ban are branded with everlasting infamy, but excite no such limits, no such sentiments beyond these limits." Unquote. The bond, the glue, holding proto-human tribes together, Darwin suggested, were altruistic feelings of sympathy for fellow members 
and loyalty to the group as a whole. As time went on, human societies grew in size and complexity, and with that process of social evolution, step for step, human beings recognized more and more fellow members and larger and larger communities. As man advances in civilization, Darwin concludes, and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races." Unquote. Today, all human beings belong to a single human community, the global village, as well as to a variety of more circumscribed human communities. Those among us who are vividly aware that the most inclusive of our nested human communities is now global in scope, are moved intrinsically to value all our fellow human beings, irrespective, as we say, of race, creed, and nationality. Humanity, we value humanity as such, and we value human civilization. Not only did Darwin foresee the time when universal human rights would be widely acknowledged, he foresaw the emergence of animal rights. Quote, sympathy beyond the confines of man that is, humanity to the lower animals, he notes, seems to be one of the latest moral acquisitions. This virtue, one of the noblest with which man is endowed, seems to arise incidentally from our sympathies becoming more tender and widely diffused until they are extended, they are extended to all sentient beings." Unquote. Now I beg to differ here with Darwin in only one small particular. <coughs> Sympathy for animals is not, in my opinion, an incidental spillover of our moral sentiments. It arises rather because we recognize a kind of fellowship and community with animals, the sense of fellowship that comes from our realization that we and many other animals are members of a community of sentient beings. But how does all of this help us to address the general question with which we began, now reformulated in light of a more scientific understanding of intrinsic value? Are some biological wholes, as well as some biological individuals, intrinsically valuable? Human beings and sentient animals are biological individuals, and Darwin helps us to understand why, upon recognition of various social ties, upon recognition of various bonds of fellowship and community, we would and should intrinsically value them. But what about species per se and ecosystems as such? More particularly, what about such species as big bluestem and silkworm? And what about ecosystems like the Iowa prairie? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that Darwin noticed that the proper objects or targets of some of our altruistic moral sentiments are, in fact, social wholes. Indeed, according to Darwin, our most basic and primitive moral sentiments were community-oriented. Quote, we have now seen, he notes, that actions are regarded by savages and were probably so regarded by primeval man as good or bad solely as they affect the welfare of the tribe, not that of an individual member of the tribe. We can sympathize and empathize only with our fellows, only with other individuals, but we mostly identify with and feel loyal to the communities that we recognize ourselves to be members of. Indeed, one such community-oriented moral sentiment, and a very powerful one at that, has a special name of its own. We call it patriotism. Patriotism or love of country is quite evidently not reducible to love of fellow citizens individually, since the most ardent patriots, at least at this time in this country, often hate the majority of their fellow citizens, especially those who are members of other races, religions, or sexual orientations. Uh, as we know from our debates about um, gays in the military. 
Walter Leopold, building upon the foundations laid down by Darwin, simply pointed out that ecology today recognizes that we are members not only of a hierarchy of, of human communities, we are also members of a hierarchy of biotic communities. Acknowledgments of our membership in the hierarchy of biotic communities, Leopold believed, would lead us to develop a land ethic. And a land ethic, according to Leopold, quote, changes the role of homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. Respect is a moral attitude that we hold only for entities that are ends in themselves. We do not respect automobiles or other things which, though highly valued, are valued only as means, only instrumentally. That is, we respect only intrinsically valuable entities. As Leopold wrote, quote, it is inconceivable to me that an ethical relation to land can exist without love, respect, and admiration for land and a high regard for its value. By value, I, of course, mean something far broader than mere economic value. I mean value in the philosophical sense, unquote. And by value in the philosophical sense, Leopold could only mean what we philosophers call intrinsic value. So, once again, does the Iowa prairie have intrinsic value? It doesn't have intrinsic value in the same way that it has a deep root system. As I understand it, value is not an independently existing objective property. The, excuse me, the Iowa prairie is rather intrinsically valuable, something that we can and should value for its own sake. Why? Because it is a type and a very paradigmatic type at that of a biotic community and from an ecological point of view we human beings are members of hierarchically organized biotic communities no less than we are members of hierarchically organized human communities. Most of us intrinsically value the latter. We value intrinsically our families, our hometowns and cities countries, if we're patriotic, and global human civilization. And to the extent that we are biologically literate, to the extent that we have absorbed the wider implications of the theory of evolution and the principles of ecology, we ought intrinsically value the former forests, prairies, lakes, and streams, marine communities, and the biosphere in which we live move, and have our being. Further, we intrinsically value the component species of intrinsically valuable biotic communities. According to Leopold, they should continue to exist as a matter of biotic right, regardless of the presence or absence of economic advantage uh, to us. Well, that's my understanding of how the Iowa Prairie is intrinsically valuable. And... Uh, Thank you very much for your attention this Saturday evening. Well, I too want to uh, thank you for inviting me here, and I'd like to thank Professor Calicott for doing a, a really admirable job of explaining and then illustrating how philosophers approach questions such as, does the Iowa prairie have intrinsic value? Just to sort of summarize where we are so far, the conclusion he reaches might be summarized this way. He wants to say, yes, the Iowa prairie do, um, is a biological whole, which, can, which we can and should value for its own sake, not just for the usefulness that it might have to something or someone else. Now, what I want to try to convince you of is that there are two major claims, uh, two major problems with the claim that the Iowa Prairie has intrinsic value, and that these problems are serious enough that we really can't yet accept Professor Calicott's conclusion. In short, I think that the prairie does not have intrinsic value.
Now, before going any further, let me sort of at least um, fictitiously or imaginatively brandish my Nature Conservancy card and tell you that I'm a great fan of prairies. I support them. I'm not saying that they're not important or valuable in any sense whatsoever. My concern is really just with the philosophical underpinnings of that sort of claim, the claim that the prairie constitutes a biological whole and that its value is of a very special kind, namely intrinsic value. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on the question of prairies rather than ecosystems in general, so some of my arguments will apply only to prairies. But I think that it's important to look at the philosophical underpinnings, not just the goals. Like-minded people can all agree on goals, but that's not good enough. We need to figure out what the best possible reasons are that we can give in supporting that view and perhaps persuading those who might not yet have seen the light. So let's start with the basic concept of intrinsic value. First of all, I'm going to agree fully with Professor Calicut's, some of Professor Calicut's general views on value, namely that we have to start asking questions about value by looking back to the valuer. We're not going to find it out there in the world independently of, of those who value it. We can't just look for some elusive property. And moreover, I think, is very specific strategy for identifying when we've hit intrinsic value as opposed to other kinds is a very good one. He wants to tell us to look for what's left over once we, once we subtract all the instrumental values and see if there's something else of value that's still left. But I think we have to go at least one step further. Now, to claim that something has value of whatever sort, whether we're talking about intrinsic or instrumental in this context, is not just to claim that some valuer somewhere in the world, for whatever reason, attaches importance to that thing. Indeed, that may not even be a necessary condition. Professor Calicott and I, and I hope everyone who addresses this as an ethical question, speaks of not just any object that happens to be um, an object of moral sentiment, but the proper object of moral sentiment. And he insists that not only are prairies things that some of us value, but it's something that we should value. Now, but if we want to make claims like this about the proper object of value and what we should value, we better give reasons to support those claims. Going back to one of Calicott's examples, uh, Peter Singer gives reasons to show why he thinks we should recognize all sentient beings as intrinsically valuable and Professor Calicott talked a bit about what his reasons were. Now, this same point about needing to give reasons is going to apply to any kind of value, instrumental as well as intrinsic. Uh, if I want to just claim that this is a good lectern, I should be able to give some reasons for what makes it a better lectern than others that might be around. Um, so, when we turn to the case of prairies then, we've got to be prepared to support our ascriptions of value. We've got to be ex prepared to explain why we think they should be valued. Now, the need for good reasons is especially clear in dealing with someone who fails to recognize the value of a prairie. The developer who sees a prairie as a fine place for a housing development, a shopping mall, or a well-manicured golf course, for example. However, this special need of persuading our political uh, opponents or those who disagree with us shouldn't obscure the fact that even among people who agree about goals, who agree that prairies are good things, um, we need to give reasons to support ascriptions of value. And I think that Professor Calicott hasn't really told us the whole story about his reasons for thinking that the Iowa prairie has intrinsic value. He's told us something. He's told us why he thinks we can value them. Because, he says, it's a community in which we live. It's a special kind of a community, a biotic community. But I'm sure that he doesn't think that any community in which we live should automatically be valued. So there's more work to be done. It's easy to find examples of social communities that, for example, are so repressive or so chaotic or so deadly to human flourishing, I mean, turn on the news just about every night and you'll find such things, that its members, the members of such social communities, 
might be quite justified in refusing to value them. We do often value our community, but that's not a necess it's not necessarily true that we should in all cases. And in the case of biotic communities too, the biotic, the immediate biotic community in which I typically live consists mostly of soybeans and corn, not blue stem grass or prairie species of any sort, interspersed with patches of Kentucky bluegrass, asphalt, pavement, and houses. Should we say that this isn't a community at all, or that we have some reasons for not assigning it the same kind of value that we assign to other sorts of biotic communities? That's the question I think we need to ask, and that's where I think the problems arise. Now, certainly, if we were to do a survey, it would be fairly easy to generate lots of reasons for valuing the Iowa prairie. They're not hard to come by. Some of the reasons, however, once we start looking at them, are straightforwardly instrumental and on Professor Callicott's own criteria. So, for example, if we justify um, protecting an ecosystem like a prairie because it provides the habitat in which species which we wish to preserve can survive, that's an instrumental value. It's good because it provides a home for something that we want to protect. Others, other reasons that people give for prairies are instrumental in a less transparent way. We might say, for example, that prairies give us a proper sense of humility by reminding us how small we are. They show us how big the sky is, how complex a system of interconnected, long-range life cycles nature can devise. In short, we describe a prairie almost as a combination of a laboratory and a museum for us to study some of these facts. It teaches us, for example, to avoid superficial, rigid, and anthropocentric judgments like fire is bad. It serves as a good intrinsic value. But of course, we might find yet other reasons on our list that seem to impute intrinsic value in a straightforward sense, such as the claim that prairies are simply beautiful, awe-inspiring. Are those good enough to justify the claim that they have intrinsic, prayer, uh, intrinsic value? Let's look a bit closer at that with the help of an imaginary dialogue. Suppose Joe says, I've been working for six years to restore the prairie on this piece of land, and it's finally starting to come together. Isn't it beautiful? Joe seems to be talking about intrinsic value. Mary says, yes, it's so much more diverse and interesting than a lawn. But you know, there aren't a lot of flowers, and why don't we just spark it up with some, let's say, purple lustra? After all, it would grow really well here, and it's such a pretty color. Joe, of course, is outraged at this suggestion. And she says, you don't understand. The point here is to reestablish the original, authentic prairie plant and to keep out exotics like purple loose strife. Mary says, well, what's the big deal about exotics? Now that we have access to more variety, why not take advantage of it? After all, a painter, doesn't have to limit herself to materials that she can gather around her own neighborhood. She takes advantage of anything that will best fit her artistic vision. Why not do the same when you try to develop a beautiful landscape? Joe, one last desperate move, says, no, authenticity is really important here. Besides, purple loosestrife is so invasive that it would choke out many of the native species and thus defeat the whole purpose. Mary says, oh, okay, so your prairie is good because it provides a place where certain species can survive in a protected location, protected from nasty things like purple loosestrife. That, of course, is one of the instrumental values we have already identified. But authenticity, why is that important? Not because it makes the prairie more beautiful, but why? Now, there's a sense in which Mary is saying, I don't get it. Her suggestion about purple loose drive reveals that much. However, she's right to be suspicious of any kind of glib assertion of intrinsic value. They don't 
always fit with what is ultimately said to be important about prairies, to be in the prairie's interest or to make the prairie better or worse. Why are authentic prairies better than prairies that have non-native species? Those values feed into the earlier sorts of reasons that led us to think that these reasons were ultimately instrumental. They make us feel more connected with our historical roots. They illustrate a particular ecosystem that was once widespread, and so on. Now, I've only been able to look at a very few of the candidates for reasons to value the Iowa prairie. And it would certainly be impossible to go through the, all the list of all the reasons that anybody might give. Indeed, it's probably going to be the case that our reasons for valuing uh, prairies are very complex and involve a combination of reasons. But I think at this point, um, the burden of proof lies with those who defend the claim that the Iowa prairie has intrinsic value. Produce, please, an explanation of this claim, a reason for valuing the prairie, that will withstand the closer scrutiny that revealed the other reasons we did look at to turn out to be instrumental. So, so far, my conclusion, pending further replies from Professor Callicott or the audience, is that the reasons typically given for valuing prairies, perhaps all once we complete the job of unpacking them, rest on the instrumental value of a prairie. They remind us of something important, they teach us valuable lessons, they illustrate something about biotic communities, and so on. Should I be worried about this? Should I think, oh my gosh, I'm opening the doors for the bulldozers? I don't think so, uh, and we can see why if we look more closely at the contrast between instrumental and intrinsic value. Professor Callicott's example of things with instrumental values are things like tools, automobiles, lamps, bricks, and so on. And those might give the impression that when we say that something has merely instrumental value, we're saying that it's prosaic, mundane, purely economic, and not very sensitive. But I don't think that that's the right way of looking at things. Some things, and libraries I think are a good example, have great instrumental value just because they make possible what is best and finest in us. To conclude that something merely has instrumental value should not denigrate it. It can be instrumental in supporting very important values and certainly non-economic values. Nor does labeling something as merely instrumentally value, valuable mean that it's somehow less important than things that are intrinsically valuable. It's not the case that sort of intrinsically valuable things go up there and instrumental, merely instrumentally valuable things always rank lower. Some things, and here food is a good example, have a great instrumental value, uh, have great instrumental value because they're absolutely necessary to sustain life. In many cases, in cases of food, for example, we may be quite right in sacrificing something of intrinsic value in order to obtain the food which is merely instrumentally valuable but which keeps us alive. An artist might sell her paintings to feed her children, for example. Um, and the same thing might be true of prairies. Now, in light of this general reflection, I've just been talking about some problems with the concepts of instrumental versus intrinsic value, and on some of the reasons that are commonly given to justify the valuation of prairies, I think we just have to conclude that the case hasn't been made yet that they have intrinsic value. It may well be, and I think it is instead, the case that they have instrumental value of a particularly pressing kind. However, there's a second serious obstacle that also raises questions about the conclusion that prairies have intrinsic value. I mentioned at the beginning that there were two. My concerns about intrinsic value was the first. Here comes my second. In order to say of anything, call it X, that it has intrinsic value, one must have some very solid idea of what X is, or at least how to identify it as an X. Thus, we must ask, 
What is a prairie? Professor Callicott recognizes the importance of this question, but tells us, and this is a quote, we have a clear enough idea of what a biotic community is to recognize the difference between a prairie and a cornfield, and to regard the wholesale replacement of the former by the latter also as a cause for alarm. Sure, we can tell the difference between prairies and cornfields, most of us, um, but I'm not sure that that's good enough. We need to look more closely. There are two facts about prairies, as opposed to perhaps some other sorts of naturally existing objects, that make this problem especially hard for prairies. The first is that the prairies we have today in Iowa are often restored rather than original. And more importantly, they exist in very small, isolated patches. The second problem with prairies is that typically they require quite a bit of human intervention to flourish and survive, at least in their present form. In order to understand why these raise difficulties, we need to look again at the general concept of what it is to be a biotic community, or any community, and why that's important for intrinsic value. Now, if I've understood Professor Callicott's position correctly, and I'm doing a lot of reading behind, uh, between the lines here, the notion of a community is sort of the glue that binds together a collection of individuals into a unit or a whole. Um, this whole may be a family, a tribe, a nation, or an ecosystem. Thus, he speaks of prairies as biological wholes, of ecosystems as one sort of distinctly holistic biological entity. We need something to weld these together into a unit. He also cites Darwin when he introduces the notion of social wholes as appropriate objects of value. The problem, of course, is that any community, whether you look at social community, mixed communities, or biotic communities, vary widely in the extent of what I may call their wholeness, that is, their own internally grounded integrity or identity. This is easy to illustrate in social communities. Contrast, for example, a nuclear family, which does have some sort of integrity or unity, with the community that gets formed when I arbitrarily break the students in my logic class into groups of six for a group project. The same will be true of collections of plants and animals. A zoo or a safari park is a biotic community, albeit one whose scope, boundaries, members, and functioning are for the most part determined by outside forces. In that sense, the safari park is more like my logic group than like a family. The choices determining the shape of this sort of community might be arbitrary. Some will be better than others. What will be lacking is the intrinsic or internal integrity, the sense of wholeness that we need to sort of form the object or to identify the object that we value. Now, in the best of all possible worlds, all ecosystems would be more like families than like zoos or logic classes. Indeed, the notion of integrity that I've been using plays an important role in both Aldo Leopold's and Baird Callicott's ethical theories. In order for Professor Callicott's argument, at least the one he offers here today, for intrinsic value to apply to something, that thing would have to be a whole, would need integrity, in a fairly robust and self-sustaining way. Therefore, we need to ask, too, whether prairies are more like families or more like zoos. Do they have the right kind of wholeness? Sadly, I think that at least as they exist today, prairies in Iowa and most other states are more like zoos. The conclusion is based on exactly those two facts that I mentioned earlier. They're existing as restorations with very limited scope and the need for human management and the natural consequences of those two facts. So the dilemma I want to pose for Professor Callicott's view is that either we admit that not all communities have wholeness in the right sort of sense, in which case Professor Callicott's argument for intrinsic value may not apply to them, or we restrict the term community 
to only those holes which do have the internal integrity that's necessary to bind these things together into a unit. But if we take that second choice, our two facts about prairies suggest that prairies won't count as communities in this more restricted sense. And once again, we don't have any reason for thinking that they can have intrinsic value or that they do have intrinsic value. Now, perhaps when Aldo Leopold looked at prairies, some were still large enough and original enough to be complete ecosystems, not just a catalog of plants, but the birds that feed on them and spread the seeds, the butterflies that were specially adapted to um, fertilize or pollinate this sort of plant, the grazers that prevented the overgrowth of larger plants, and the predators that limit the population of grazers, and so on and so on. Now, maybe when Ted Turner gets finished with Montana and the buffalo and perhaps the wolves that he might bring in after that, he'd turn his attention to the Iowa prairie, and it can be that way again. But prairies, as we have them and value them today, fall far, far short of that kind of completeness and unity. The Iowa prairie may have a few dick thistles, but they also have their share of English sparrows. The little pockets of prairies are inevitably surrounded by suburban or urban environments that disrupt the purity and integrity of the prairie. The problem is not just one of size, although size and scale is an important factor. Restoration, even on a grand scale, raises questions about unity, integrity, and identity. When an ecosystem evolves gradually and naturally, it, in a sense, defines its own identity. The plants and animals in the system belong there. They're legitimate members of the community. They evolve as part of it. By definition, too, the species that aren't represented in that system aren't really part of the system. So in that sense, the evolution defines the identity. On the other hand, when we set out to restore a prairie, we have to decide what belongs in it and what doesn't. We have to make that decision. We, in doing that, we rely in part on historical record. But those are often incomplete or inaccurate. We also try to examine the few bits of original prairies that we can still find. But that's a, a process like trying to understand gorillas by looking at a single gorilla in a barren cage in the Central Park Zoo. And even that assumes that we've got a label on our cage, that we can recognize an original prairie when we find it, that we can distinguish between the indigenous life and the exotics that have contaminated it. What are the odds that we're getting this right? I think that they're not that good. Finally, and I have only time to raise the question, and I'm not going to explore it, although perhaps we can do so in the discussion period, uh, how do we factor in human influence into the biotic community? This is particularly a concern with prairies, since prairies need to be burned periodically, something that has required human intervention for a long time, including burning by Native Americans before European settlers got here. Most prairies also require some sort of weeding in some way to eradicate exotic species that inevitably contaminate it. How much did these considerations affect and undermine the identity of prairies as biotic communities? I think it makes their identity more dependent on us. To sum up, because many apparently intrinsic values turn out to be instrumental when we look at them more closely, and also because it's not clear that prairies today, at least, have the sort of wholeness or integrity that makes them even potential objects of value in their own right, I have to conclude that prairies do not have intrinsic value. That doesn't mean we should not preserve and cherish them, but it does mean that we need a different moral foundation and justification for that preservation. Thank you. We've decided, because of the time, to go right into comments and questions. And what we'll do is I'll sort of umpire. I'll point at you, and then you've got the floor. And identify the person with whom you'd like to talk. Mike? Thank you. 
Um, I think that, um, let me take the second one first. Uh, that test is something that I took from Professor Calicott. That is, he wants to say that uh, one way of showing that something is at least a possible object for value is to show that it's a community. And I think that that um, sense of community that he's evoking implicitly requires some sort of wholeness and integrity. In fact, I think he, you know, would agree that integrity plays an important role in, in defining that. So I'm just using his test there. Uh, now, to the first one, that wasn't my intention. The reason um, I talked about uh, purple loosestrife and adding other flowers is uh, that I think that when we ask what makes something better or worse, that can give us a clue. It's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a tactical clue. Uh, that can give us a clue as to um, why we value something. So um, if, for example, I'm a coin collector, and I automatically say, well, the older one is better, that might be, give me a clue as to what it is I value about those coins. Um, when we find out that getting rid of purple loose rice rather than adding it, adds value to the prairie, makes it better, that gives us a clue as to why we value um, prairie. Uh, the real test, I mean, that, that's just a clue for saying, uh, it turns out not to be variety in any sense, but authenticity that we care about. That's what getting rid of the purple loose rice gives us. Um, now the question is, is authenticity a intrinsic or an incremental value? Well, do we value things as authentic because they enable us to do something else, do something further? And, and there I think I'm following again Professor Calicott's definition. So what I was trying to do was just apply his test, but show that things like authenticity turn out to be valued not for their own sake, but because they, uh, as I said, just get us closer to our historical roots or illustrate an ecosystem that used to be a very important part of this land and so on. So um, I would say that in the case of your first test, that's not a test that I want to use the way you described it. Bear, anything to go with that? Next. Michelle. Professor Kalikoff, like Professor Michelle, I'm worried about your account of intrinsic value. You rejected rationality as a criterion for um, ascribing intrinsic value to something. But I'm afraid that your account of intrinsic value is going to be too narrow, too, because it doesn't seem as though it would allow the intrinsic value of a piece of art or something like that, which we would normally say has intrinsic value as well. On the other hand, Thank you. 
Sean, you want to give me that? Or, sorry, okay. Lily. Um, I don't. I don't think we maybe want to get into it very. Uh, but I think that that criterion is inconsistent with the account of value with, with which you began about that uh, intrinsic value is what valuers can value for its own sake rather than for something else. I, I don't think that those two tests, but that test, the test you just proposed, will fit that definition mm -hmm. uh, because uh, according to the uh, definition that you gave earlier, uh, a painting is intrinsically valuable, or intrinsically valued, if we value the painting for its own sake rather than for... But I don't think we do. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think that we value it for the aesthetic experience that it provides us, not for its own sake. Just as we value, I mean, to, to compare great and complicated Next question or comment? Yes. Mark? Can anyone ever understand what we mean by for its own sake? Uh, I tried to provide some examples. Uh, I think we have a good example right here. I'm saying that art objects are not valued for their own sake. However, the event, I did try to give a few examples of what people do value for their own sake. And it seems to me that the most the, the most clear case, at least for those of us who are parents, and perhaps for those of us who have parents, which would include everyone, is the way parents value their children. I mean, children can be, for parents, a, a, a real nuisance and a hassle. Uh, they're expensive. Uh, lots of times they turn out to be rotten. Uh, you know, and how many, how many uh, mothers of uh, uh, social mis misfits uh, and uh, d uh, downright criminals, uh, nevertheless, value intrinsically their, their children. Their children are useless to them, useless to society, uh, and so on, and yet, 
are valued for their, their own sake. Now, this seems to me to be a, a clear an example. And this is my touchstone that I, I'm trying to suggest. Yes, we know what it is to value something for its own sake. For example, the way parents value their, their children. And then let's see if we can work out from that, that sure footing. And, and, and by way of analogy and similarity, are there other things that, that we can take this as, a, as a, uh, an experience that we have and also uh, find ourselves valuing other things in a, in a similar way? L let me just follow up on that, okay, and push this between the two of you a little further. What would be the difference in the policies of the government of the state of Iowa were you or Lilly, but not both, advising the legislature and the government with regard to policy concerning prairies in the state of Iowa? What would be the difference? Yes, the difference is this. Uh, this is a question that's been pressed by uh, our colleague, Brian Norton, who is also an ambulcentist, as to say, thinks of uh, nature though having this full range of, of instrumental values, which really so nicely uh, suggested, not just uh, what you call them, banal objects or something like that, uh, pedestrian things, but that we, we instrumentally value nature in all sorts of higher ways for aesthetic, um, as an aesthetic resource, as a, as a a sacred place. It, it transforms us and makes us better and so on. When we, when, we, when we bring all of these values, instrumental values, to bear upon nature, our colleague Brian Norton suggests that we have what he calls the convergence hypothesis. The intrinsic value thesis and the instrumental value thesis converge on precisely the same policy. So all of this is astute, and this is Norton's point though he is a philosopher, I regard him as somewhat anti-philosophical philosopher, uh, he says that uh, all of this uh, talk about intrinsic value is worse than a mere academic de debate. It, 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 it distracts attention from the real issues which are pragmatic in policy. We shouldn't be here talking about uh, uh, how we value uh, prejudice. We should be, we, sh we should be trying to to implement the values that we have, and, and especially this, this notion of intrinsic value is controversial. So let's leave that out. That only, that's only divisive among environmentalists, and let's just go with the conservative uh, uh, anthropocentric and instrumental view. Now, I have, uh, I think that, that Norton is dead wrong about this. I think that the, there is a significant and a profound uh, impact, practical impact, that intrinsic value makes in the policy arena. And what is that impact? It shifts the burden of proof from those who want to appropriate and use, uh, excuse me, it shifts the burden of proof from those who want to save prayer to those who want to appropriate and use them for developmental purposes. Because if, if something has intrinsic value, then it has a prima facie right or case to exist. If, on the other hand, it's only instrumentally valuable, then it has to compete head-to-head -head with all of the other possible uses, all of the other instrumental uses, and generally, if it's a shopping mall as opposed to, to a, a uh, prairie, then and we, we translate all of our instrumental values. This is what economists do. They make a cottage industry out of this. They, they put a dollar value on it. OK, you find the prairie beautiful. You find it a, a place of solitude and spiritual inspiration. How much is that worth to you? We can we put a dollar value on art, let's put a dollar value on our aesthetic experience, and then compare that 
with the economic benefit to the shopping mall, and what's going to happen? The shopping mall is going to win uh, in practically each and every case, unless you're talking about something so gorgeous and so traditionally uh, cherished as the as the Yosemite Valley or something like that, in which case then perhaps if we talk about all the tourist dollars and so on, then that uh, goes good. So if we say that it's intrinsically valuable, if we can make a persuasive case for this that persuades the public, and we've done this, there's a precedent for this, by the way, in the Endangered Species Act, then the burden of proof is shifted to those who want to appropriate it and, and use it. They have to prove that that their their the, the instrumental values are so overwhelming that they that they cancel or they even set aside the intrinsic value. Lily, any reply? Um, I think that uh, Baird is right in saying that in terms of deciding which practical policies we would both advocate, that it's not going to our philosophical differences aren't going to make that difference. I disagree with him about the the fact that talking about intrinsic value versus instrumental value should shift the burden of, uh, of proof. That is, it would be a justification for shifting the burden of proof onto those who want to use, a, you know, tear up the prairie, um, only if we had this picture of instrumental value as somehow um, better, of it, um, higher than all instrumental values. I think, in fact, both instrumental and intrinsic values are going to have to go head to head with each other um, in any kind of conflict. And the problem is going to be as difficult for uh, one sort of value as for the other. Um, now, I, I put that in terms of it shouldn't shift the burden of proof. I think that when we try to give reasons to support our policies, explain how we think these things these conflicts ought to be decided. We could go Madison Avenue. It may turn out that intrinsic value is a nice tax slogan to just get people to vote. Um, but I don't think either Barrett or I want to say that in a good community, we manipulate the citizens that way. We want to give the best possible reason. And I think on that basis, we have to go back to, does it make sense to talk in this way? Good. Yes, Mark? Does that take us? Does it take us from both of your perspectives in, in this kind of direction? Ultimately, the answer to the question: How do you identify what is straightforwardly, or in, in your senses, intrinsically valuable? Has more to do with those who do the valuing, and less to do with what is valued. When it comes to the matter of explaining exactly what it is that makes anything intrinsically valuable? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think that, that we, it, it comes back to policy yeah. and so on, that 
Well, what we're doing here at Park is, is something where I think this is a benefit of the non-profit in the audience, something called the Meta Academy. That is to say, we're trying to identify uh, here, uh, this, we're trying to say something about ethics and what its foundations are and so on. I think that in policy debates, we assume these, these foundations. We, 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 we just, we don't, we don't talk about them. We know that we have, that we value things that perhaps we're not clear about this, that's why we do philosophy about it, we try to make these things clear and raise them to the surface. But these are sort of the, the assumed things, the under the surface things, they're very often not very well articulated and so on, but nevertheless they're assumed. And so what we want to do is talk about the various objects that are candidates for things that we intrinsically value. And there are some paradigm cases, parents and their children, for example, children as intrinsically valuable things. And then we have some problematic things. Yeah. Should we value uh, something like uh, other animals? And then how do we how do we address this issue? We've got animal rights people. What what are they what are they trying how do they try to convince us? Well they talk about animals. They talk about the, the capacities of animals. Did you guys see uh, about let me see, I think it was in, in about March of last year, a Time magazine cover with a, a chimpanzee on it, and it was all about how we undervalued animal mental capacity. So we're, we talked about animals. These are, these are the sorts of capacities that they have, and those happen to be the sorts of capacities that, in my language here, sort of tickle our, our intrinsic value nerve cells, so to speak. They stimulate in us uh, intrinsic value. Now, as an environmentalist, I want to go beyond the rather straightforward and simple case of animals, and I want to talk about species and, and biotic communities. Do they have the kinds of characteristics that address our uh, intrinsic value dimensions of our nervous system? Mike, go ahead. I'm very worried about basing the intrinsic value on Darwin uh, would use this, and I think that, that Leopold is 
building upon it, is that we expand our sense of what it means to belong, our sense of us. We begin to include uh, the people on the other side of the river who used to be uh, stigmatized as subhuman, uh, and uh, now we have come to a, a, an inclusive humanism. The next step is, is, is animals and uh, the environment and so on. So where is the other? And this is what I, I call the Copernican concept, the, the Copernican dimension of the land ethic. I mean, we're now representing uh, our planet from the point of view of the, the moonshot as a community in a hostile sort of, of uh, solar system and beyond. Uh, that's the other, this is the community, and so we, we, we feel that we uh, live on a, uh, a cozy and small planet. Now all of this is what I call cognitively massaging our, uh, our um, uh, moral sentiments. We're not hardwired for these these sorts of, of uh, 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 traditional limitations on our society. Lily, jump in. Yeah, um, I think that and what I would want to say to that, and to what you were suggesting, would also perhaps answer your question. And it gets back to the point that I made at the very beginning, that if we're going to be talking about what we should value, we have to be prepared to give reasons. As soon as you give reasons, you have to, as it were, play by the rules of reasons, and one of those rules is consistency. And that's the standard argument against sexism, against racism. Uh, Singer tries to generate it as not to use extended to an argument against speciesism. But it comes back to once you've uh, been forced to articulate why you value um, X, whether that value be intrinsic or incremental, you then have to be prepared to accept the fact that in order to be consistent, you have to value other things that have that same kind of characteristic. So again, I would agree with Baird in this sense that when we start looking for what sorts of things we value, we have to look to the things we value and why we value them. But I think that that's going to also provide a bulwark against the sort of provincialism that you were concerned it's the bewitching hour, 9.30. We'd like to thank Lily and Baird for being our guests, and we'd also like to thank you very much for coming. Good night.